Well, I want to wel yeah. welcome all of you to Southwest Winds Birding and Nature Festival 2022. And we are blessed to have Rick Collins as our next speaker. Rick Collins is a park ranger at Kimakakori National Historic Park. And correct me if I said that wrong. You did. <laughs> I'll make you sing it later. <laughs> he also serves as vice president of the Tubac Historical Society, serves on the board for the Tucson Presidio Trust, volunteers with exhibits and education with the Tubac Presidio State Historic Park, and coordinates the Juan Batista de Anza National Historic Trail Mounted Color Guard. So, shall we all welcome? Watch the it's just for the record, it's Tuma Cockery. Tuma Cockery. But pretend like you're a park ranger and only say the first four letters of the words of Tuma. Tuma. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. <laughs> all, all of you been to Tuma Cockery? No. no. Some have, some have. Well, I, we also, I'm just going to preface this ahead of time. We have two other missions in Yankee. January through March, you have to go with the Ranger, but it's one of the best things we do. Mission Gavave and Mission Calabasas. So in 1990, Tumacacri National Monument received national park status, joins the rank of 51 other national historical parks in the United States. It also gained two related missions, Mission Gavave and Mission Calabasas. In 2005, it grew to 360 acres from 10 acres originally. And it includes a mile of beautiful riparian habitat along the Santa Cruz River, and the Juan Batista de, uh, de Anza National Historic Trail runs right through there. It also has a great relationship with the Tubac Presidio State Historic Park. Those three elements bring a great deal of rich history together in a three mile space. Tumacacri, being a national park, of course, is the linchpin. Now, how did the old mission get such status anyway? The story of Tumacacri is a story of a place that really should never have been, and yet now it's a national treasure. The old mission is haunted by a kind of luck, not good luck, not bad luck. I call it Tumacacri luck. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. In 1691, a Jesuit priest, Father Eusebio Kino, wandered north down the Santa Cruz River to evangelize and create missions. Kino reached the point he's ready to turn back. Had he given up at that point, Tumacacri probably would not exist. But Tumacacri luck. Kino is greeted by a group of Atom people, both from Tumacacri and from what would later become San Javier del Bac. He was urged to visit those villages by those very people. And Kino tells us he was greeted with crosses. Now, Kino established a brand new mission right there on the river and designated it San Cayetano de Tumacacri. The mission is below, or the mission was originally below a tall mountain near the junction of the Santa Cruz River and the Sonoy Creek, known as San Cayetano Peak. The Tumacacri part of the name is a little vague. The Atom don't even have a good translation or a good pronunciation of the word Tumacacri. Um, Depending on which Atham dialect you use, and there are nine, it may mean at uh, the foot of the Caliche Hills, which are across the freeway. It also may mean at the Hat Moon Bend of the River, which is about where the original village was. Uh, it also may mean where the wild chili peppers grow, so you, you <laughs> pick one, okay? Um, the Atham built three Romanas for Kino. They built the house. They built him a church which is basically a small Ramada. And finally, they built a cooking Ramada. And Kino and the Atom end up with a very affectionate relationship toward each other. Now, Tumacacri from day one, Tumacacri from day one is a Visita mission. That's a mission without a resident priest. Kino, despite his affection for the people, does not visit very often. We know he's exploring just about everywhere. Throughout his career, he's putting out a hundred tiny fires between Spanish people and the Atomi. 
Tino's most important contribution to the Occam was he got a 10 year guarantee that these people would not have to pay taxes and would not be forced into any kind of labor or anything. It's believed basically that Kino put a whole lot of missions everywhere because wherever he found a sizable population, he would call it a mission and protect those people. So the time period that Kino comes is at the end of the conquistador period. Now the conquistador period is over, but there's still an attitude that you can abuse people. And Kino buys enough time for in a 10 year period that that attitude tends to go away. In 1695, Kino commented there were sheep and goats and that there were fields of wheat and maize. That means in only four years, we already have large wheat fields at Tumacacre. Maize or corn was of course native, but wheat and livestock are introduced. Kino doesn't specifically mention cows, but we know they're there. A little bit, Kino gets a lot of credit, and you'll hear people say, well, Kino introduced beef and wheat, and that's not really true. Uh, the Occam, having had a trade route, had uh, actually had, were planting wheat 30 years before Kino got there. They weren't doing an efficient job because they hadn't become Kansas farmers yet, but they were, <laughs> but they were planting wheat. At the time Kino arrives on the frontier, there are 100,000 cows on the frontier, but they're not your cows, so if you took one, you would be a, a rustler. Now in 1697, six years after his first arrival, Kino reports that Tumacacri had 23 Indian residences. He doesn't tell us how many people, but basically the math is times four, okay? Um, the natives were ready to accept a resident priest. They built a flat roofed house in anticipation of the priest. But they didn't get one. As I said, Kino was exploring everywhere. He runs around to California. He proves that California is not an island. Sometimes we regret that. And he wrote <laughs> the first astronomy text in the New World. Uh, Kino ends up dying of a fever at 65 years of age, which I consider young, and after 20 years on the frontier. His death left the void. The North frontier pretty much without the presence of the priest for a long time. Tumacacri luck had struck. It wasn't until 20 years after Kino's death in the 1730s that enough priests were in Spain <coughs> to repopulate the northern missions. San Cayetano remains a visita, but at least finally it's got a priest to baptize and bury on occasion. Now it's worth talking about what makes a, a good missionary priest because of your age. Uh, I'll tell you this, it, it, what we find is that you want to be about 35 to 40 years old. Any older than that, uh, it's just the country's too rough. Any younger than that, and you've got too much ego on you. So that seems to be the best age for a priest. There's a wonderful quote that I love that they talk about a brand new young priest that's brought up to the frontier. And they say, he is too tender for this barbarian. Now in 1751, an uprising occurs on the frontier. 105 people are killed, including women and children, including native peoples, and including three priests. Well, the revolt flickers out almost as fast as it comes up, and by March of 1752, it's over, okay? But Tumacacri, in the meantime, had been completely abandoned. The people at Tumacacri, the people at Tubac that are not involved in the revolt, run up into the Santa Rita Mountains, and they hide. Uh, the Otham, they stay up there in the mountains because they're afraid of, A, being hurt by the rebels, but they're also afraid, and mostly justly, by, of uh, Spanish retribution to that. So once again, the mission seems to have ended. Well, the rebellion does have profound effects. A fort was built at the former native village of Tubac. A town of Spanish civilians immediately come in and put a settlement just to the south of the fort, okay, because they sent safety. Um, and they begin farming on all the abandoned Otham land. Well, the natives also realizing that things are safe start filtering back in too, and they're like, uh, wait a minute, that used to be mine. And it's like, finders keepers, you weren't here, you know. <laughs> uh, Captain Bill Rain, the commander of Tubac, suddenly finds himself with Otham everywhere. So he makes a plan to move the civilian natives down to join the mission natives, okay? Well, 
he didn't even consider the old San Cayetano site, which is about a mile south of uh, where the present Timucaga is. Um, he wrote down, he needed, he has a whole bunch of devout people in his own fort and village, including his wife, who's very, very devout. And so he needs to be put it closer. Tumacacari and Tubac are an hour walk apart, and that's much better than what was before. Um, also, the priest of the mission can start actually uh, ministering to the, the civilians in Tubac. So that's kind of the plan. So basically, he, changed, he, he selects the location of the present Tumacacari because it has a large expanse of flat farmable land and it's well watered. In fact, the river, the Santa Cruz River, goes underground right at Tubac and disappears. Okay. San Cayetano, he, he actually founds the new mission on March 19th and names it because it's the Feast of St. Joseph, San Jose de Tumacacari. San Cayetano, that name just disappears. It is not until January of 1754, over two years after the revolt ended, that Tumacacari finally sees a priest again. And it also took that long to bring the faithful but scared back out of the mountains and back into the fold. Now, Tumacacri, or excuse me, Tubac's growing population must have really benefited the mission because by 1757, there's a small Jesuit hall church. It wasn't much. One priest actually describes it as a cramped and flimsy little chapel. As late as 1772, the church and the house of the priest were devoid of all ornamentation or decoration. The Jesuit church, the little church, would actually be used from 1757 to 1822, a total of 64 years. The big new church, the ruin we see today at Timacacri, actually got used with a priest for only five years. By 1760, things began to change drastically. Job opportunities out the mission for natives had increased. The Spanish government and elites were totally conflicted about when and where and how the natives should best be served and how they could also serve the king. The population of Spanish citizens moving north had actually increased so much that the natives were now in a minority. By 1760, Tumacacri has 93 native people, and that native population is dealing with a major issue. Disease. Disease is the number one issue. Through the 1740s, there are epidemics almost every year. That loss of life was probably the major reason for the 1751 revolt that happened. Smallpox and measles are main killers. The normal death rate in all the missions and on the frontier is the same as anywhere in New Spain. It's a few people a year. But every seven to nine years, a plague would sweep through and devastate the people. Native populations in small desert villages would remain aloof from each other, but that means they didn't build up immunity and so that they kept giving fresh water to the disease. Now, the loss of life is disruptive to every aspect of the cultures it afflicts, okay? Since measles will kill every one out of every three children, it still happens today, by the way, and smallpox takes out most of the young adults, okay? That means that all the customs and ceremonies are lost, but think even smaller. Imagine that you lose the knowledge of how to cook, how to use foods, how to clean your house, how to hunt. Everything is lost. Imagine it's somebody my age or your age, and we actually have to teach the little baby on the ground how to do all the things that he needs to do or she needs to do. And of course, we're getting old and our back hurts and all that kind of stuff. So that is all lost. A whole generation basically is cut out by disease. Disease, by the way, is always a much bigger issue than Apaches. Apaches are scary and all that kind of stuff. But they, there's only three real attacks on Tumacacri Mission, for instance, during its whole uh, period of existence. But 1781, 10% of the population of 
to my concrete gets wiped out by smallpox. Now imagine if there's a hundred of us and ten of us die, that's going to affect farming and cattle raising and digging out uh, irrigation canals and everything else. That's going to practically destroy you. But it was a disease that almost ends Tumacacri again. It's politics. In 1767, Carlos III, the king of Spain, cripples the mission system once and for all. That's not to say the mission system actually dies. It will last for a long time. But the mission system would never, ever dominate the frontier again. In late July of 1767, all the Jesuit priests were gathered up and expelled from the frontier. With no priests to manage the Tumacacre mission, food surpluses were eaten, all the livestock was taken by the natives and turned into their own herds. It seemed, again, the mission system is all over. Well, almost exactly a year later, Carlos III chooses the Franciscans to replace the Jesuits. But for the Franciscans, the mission had changed. The king has embraced the Enlightenment. You will all be treated equally. Okay? Everybody's going to be, be treated nicely. The land now belongs to the natives again. So taking it away from the church and giving it to the natives. You priests will do nothing but save souls. Well, that, that change actually reflects a school of thought among most Spanish leaders. Spanish people on the frontier are now skeptical of the missions. Most of the time, most of this time, the mission is considered a failure, and most people think the natives should be made into Spanish citizens. To the government, that means taxpaying citizens, of course. And the autumn themselves, as I said, see employment opportunities outside of the mission. The mission is very limiting in what can happen. The priest, on the other hand, considered the civilian population of Spaniards to be corrupt and abusive toward the natives. And in reality, both sides are pretty much right. But the Franciscans put new energy into the mission. They sit there and go, how do we keep these people since we no longer have the control the Jesuits had? And they salute the glory of God. So they dazzle with what they build. Um, the Franciscans tended to be more zealous than the Jesuits were. The Jesuits were real good about incorporating native ritual into Catholic ceremonies. The Franciscans don't do that, so as a rule. The glorification of God and the dazzling of natives means that we're going to build enormous European-style cathedrals in the middle of nowhere. And we're going to use a lot of bright and attractive decorations. By 1803, Tuma has a five foot thick foundation, complete with transepts, the part that makes it look like a cross from the sky. Master masons are hired and a crew of 63 construction workers comes down and joins the population in Tuma The new church is gonna be magnificent, with two bell towers and a massive facade. In fact, Tuma is gonna be a triplet with San Javier del Bac and with La Parisima Concepcion in Cabrera, Mexico. Question, who's funding this? How do they fund it? Uh, the King of Spain at this time. Okay. Okay. And then the foundation sits. Napoleon Bonaparte, of course, is invading Europe everywhere and he invades Spain. There's a growing Mexican independence movement that starts happening in about 1810. All the money dries up. In 1821, Mexico gains its independence from Spain. There's a new priest at the mission. To finish the church, he decides to sell off 4,000 of the 5,000 cows owned by the mission. And I want you to think about the environmental impact on the river with that many cows out there. <coughs> the first payment is made by the cattle buyer. The church walls reach seven feet tall. And then the cattle buyer defaults. There's so much chaos on the frontier, he doesn't pay. So once again, the building stops. Well, with a lot of maneuvering, the, finally the debt was paid. The church takes shape. The walled cemetery is built a warehouse and a 
elaborate facility, working facility, were constructed. The new church would be modest compared to the original dream. It would not have the transepts or the two bell towers. It would receive a flat wooden roof rather than a great brick vaulted roof. Had it got the brick vaulted roof that was originally uh, envisioned for this place, it would probably be an active native church just like some have here. Still, the church was beautiful. It's just magnificent. The, being on the frontier, you think it would suffer from distance and a lack of talent, but instead it finds inspired craftsmen. The same master masons who built San Javier de la Baca and Comborca actually planned Timacacri. The Michelangelo of Mexico actually paints the interior, or a student of his paints the interior, rather. It has an oranges pink facade trimmed with reds, blacks, blues, and yellows. The church has Roman, Egyptian, and Moorish architectural influences. It's just, it's the, the niches, the upper niches, Moorish, the lower niches, Roman, the, the shelves that the statues sit on stay way out from the building to really entice you and really celebrate that glory of God. Even real copper paint and brass paint are used in there. Uh, the reds are still beautiful today. Most of the colors are natural pigments, mostly are from the region. The orange base coat on the front of this church was actually made from iron oxide, an easy thing to do. Lamp black joins white and actually produces a blue. By the way, it's worth noting you're all familiar with San Javier, the white dove of the desert. It was not white until 1906, because if you want your if you want to make your natives happy, you paint color. A priest and our bishop in 1906 said white means purity, therefore it will be white. So that's why it's white. Hmm. By 1822, actually, this is the 200th anniversary this year on December 13th of the first mass that happens in the building. Um, so it's, it's basically complete by 1822. By 1828, all but the bell tower was finished, and the church boasts a flock of 700 people, including natives, ranchers, civilians. The place is literally alive with people. And then, Tumacacri luck strikes again. On December 20th, 1827, Mexico passes an expulsion law. Since independence in 1821, the Mexican economy has been crashing to the ground. And so the Mexicans did what we all do, look around, got to be somebody to blame. So they pick all the Spanish born Spaniards and they throw them out of the country. Our priest is actually a Spaniard and he was kicked out having left the bell tower and some inside painting unfinished. In 1833, Mexico secularizes all of the religious properties. And that begins the slow deterioration of the church building. Now, a tornado of events actually ends Tumacacri's life as a church or a mission. A little Latam village still protected the mission buildings at that point in time. And then, in 1848, the early cold spell, the war with Mexico, and finally on December 9, 1848, an Apache attack causes total abandonment. The usual explanation that you'll read in Park Service literature and everything is that the Apache attack did it. Well, it's not the first. It wouldn't be the last. I mean, that's not where it really did it. But the real true thing that did it is that when the California gold rush happened, every walking, talking Mexican male said, hey, chance to get rich. And they all headed off, leaving women and older people and children, of course, and everything. So when the Apache attack happened, it had a little more impact on it. Now, Timacacri is abandoned. In fact, the whole valley is abandoned. All the Tumacanos, the civilian, Spanish civilians or Mexican civilians at this point, moved to Tucson or just over the border to San Carlos. I mean, Santa Cruz, rather. The Atom at Tumacacri take every single statue out of the building, the vestments and everything they could carry, and they go to San Javier. Those items from Tumacacri would actually stay in storage at 
at the Sun Javier for a very, very long time. In 1849, the church is totally abandoned. There's no resident priest. The remaining statues and paintings are gathering dust. Religious papers are drifting across the floor. Then the next people to write about the mission are the 49ers on route, right? En route to the California Gold Rush from back east. 60,000 people will travel down the Santa Cruz River on the way to California. Imagine the impact. A diary entry from one of the early 49ers um, found the church totally intact with beautiful paintings um, and 49ers passing through uh, will chronicle, chronicle the vandalism and the demise of the church. One account recorded that men cut and dropped one of the bells to the ground. The roof timbers were used in nearby ranchers. Most of what was left that could be carried away is carried away, including the doors. The church building becomes a camping site. Black soot can be seen in the sacristy even today from campfires. The baptistry was turned into a hay barn. By 1858, a 49er journal tells us that the church is without a roof. Now, ghost stories also came along as the 49ers passed. The bells could be heard inexplicably ringing. A ghostly choir would be heard at night, and lights would shine in the tower when no one was there. By the way, the bell, uh, the bells are still heard by people today when they're, they're not ringing, and many people with a, a predisposition for that kind of thing will say, ooh, it's very noisy in here with the spirits. Usually in the baptistry, which is where you begin life, which I never figured out. The church is only 25 years old, but it sits empty. Nothing but a quaint room to visit or to plunder. But again, Tumacacari is saved. During the latter part of the 19th century, a revival of interest in antiquities caused many people to be concerned about the preservation of archaeological sites in the American Southwest. Tumacacari's church was one of those sites that attracted attention. There's a reverence for the site at this time, as if it were an Egyptian tomb. By 1900, the movement to preserve southwestern sites catches the imagination of the public and was led by scientists and scholars. In 1907, the Tucson Pioneer Historical Society asked the U.S. Forest Service to help preserve the mission. A letter of support to the Secretary of Interior uh, explained that old Tumacacari mission of, is of such historical interest to warrant its protection from all unseemly exploitation. The initial result was important, if not small. A fence was erected around the church building to keep the cows out. Okay? That was under the Forest Service. Okay? In June of 1906, Theodore Roosevelt signs the Antiquities Act into law. Amazingly, the Antiquities Act is only one page long. Can you imagine that today? The statute includes three sections, though. Section two of the law authorizes the president to establish, or in the terminology of the act, to declare by public proclamation national monuments and reserve them for proper care and management. In 1908, Roosevelt made Tumacacri a national monument of land donated by a local Mexican-American homesteader named Carmen Mendez. Ten acres is what the mission was originally of, and it joined at that time 17 other national monuments and five other national parks. But yet again, the old mission stops in its tracks. A lingering battle happens over an old Spanish land grant. Tumacacri is on disputed land which runs from Tubac to Nogales. From 1908 to 1970, Tumacacri is in limbo. Though the land claim was won by the claimant, basically a giant swindle, in a great tragedy, legal homesteaders were all kicked off their land in the Santa Cruz Valley. In what I suspect was a backroom deal, Tumacacri was given back to the uh, government and back to the Park Service. The comptroller of the general Comptroller General of the United States kept all this very, very quiet and nothing to see here. But basically, because of this, Tumacacri is the only national park with two birthdays, 1908 and 1917. 
Now, Tuma Kagri is a partially restored room. Restoration is the return of a building to its original condition, uh, if possible, which often means rebuilding. The decision was made early on that Tuma Kakari would never be re a rebuilt mission or church building. The term that the Perch Service used is from a philosophy called arrested decay. We won't let it fall down. Okay. The new national monument was very, very lucky to have a, a man of vision and one might say with a missionary zealous passion to preserve and protect. Um, Park Superintendent Frank Pinkley was put in charge of the project. It is very important to note that all of the initial work done on Tumacacri was carried out by donations. The workers did their best to use the same materials, natural materials, to repair the church that were used in building it. They harvested pine timbers right from the Santa Rita's, just like the priest did 100 years before. Um, they even hauled them off the mountain with oxen and mules, just like they did before. Originally, Pinkley, interesting, and Pinkley had the adobes made in Nogales, the big city of Nogales, and, but they found out on the bad road from Nogales to Timacacri that they were all busted up and turned into dust by the time they got there. So they started making the bricks on site, something we still do today. There were some, uh, here's a, a photo of the guys actually ad, hand adding the timbers that will go up on the roof again. 100 years to the year that the first roof went up. There were some big, big mistakes made along the way in the 1940s, with the war on, of course, maintenance became more important than quality restoration. And building fabric and concrete were used because they were cheaper and supposedly better treatment. Those man-made substitutes caused a rapid deterioration of the buildings. The Park Service would spend an enormous amount of your tax money to undo those good ideas. Okay. The first park rangers had their hands full. There was no running water or electricity. In fact, the original mission irrigation ditches provided water for the rangers and their families. The first park quarters were actually put in a standing room. Grocery stores were a very, very long way away. The First park ranger's uh, wife would actually go to the still existent orchard and use and can peaches in Queensland. <coughs> One of the biggest issues that the first rangers had to deal with were treasure hunters. One ranger even had a German shepherd to guard the grounds. They would patrol nightly with rifles and lanterns to watch the place. One of the early rangers uh, even created a Jesuit treasure map of the Santa Rita's, which he sold to Eager and Gullible Treasure Seekers. He sold a lot of maps, actually. So. And treasure hunters even dug up two priests who had been buried on the altar. The treasure hole provided no treasure, and the skeletons were returned to the hole and covered up with dirt. One skull was taken by the treasure hunters, though. In the 1930s, the priests were dug up again, this time by archaeologists in the Franciscan order, and moved to San Javier Mortuary, where they stay today, with blocks with their names on it still there. The skull, of course, also provides us one of the ghost stories in the church even today. And I should tell you, treasure hunters will still come into the park. They come into the visitor center. I had one last year, a guy came in and told me, I know the government is hiding the treasure from us because they want it for themselves. <laughs> and the thing is to think about is there's one priest and a hundred natives and they're trying to stay alive and have enough food. Nobody has time to go treasure hunting. The park service is working with very, very little park service is working with very, very little money in the early days. Yosemite and Yellowstone were getting all the attention as you can expect. Uh, the park service initially wasn't even more sure what to do with the dirt ruins like Casa Grande and Tumacacri. Boss Pinkley himself was responsible for 14 national monuments. It's actually the depression which changes things for the better. J. H. Tovria, the, the first historic architect of the Park Service, waved a red flag. 20 years from now, if someone asks a ranger at Tumacacri a question of what parts of the mission are original and what parts are restored, the ranger is going to be embarrassed because the chances are he will not know 
because there is no record of what is old and what is restored. I would respectfully request that the NPS make detailed measured drawings of the walls of the buildings, showing all restored portions. If this is not done, soon this very necessary information will be lost forever. Guess what? A lot of it's lost forever. <laughs> the New Deal program included legislation, the Historic Sites Act of 1935, which employed a thousand architects and photographers to document historic structures throughout the United States. For Tumacocri, it meant a new visitor center. That in itself is actually artistically and historic, artistic and historic structure. And if you look closely, you'll see that every single piece of structure is based on Kino Sonoran missions. A 1935 trip to Mexico guided the design of the visitor center, so that's where they got the ideas from. The visitor center was even designed around a special viewing room that frames the view of the church building. It is one of the most iconic views of the national parks and one of the most commonly photographed spots. Even the garden was considered a big deal. The original concept in the, of the garden is kind of fun. It was all supposed to be edible and medicinal plants. They quickly realized that wasn't going to work because in the wintertime they all die off. So it's not very pretty. So nowadays, the garden is basically an idealized Spanish mission garden. Now, <clears throat> Tumacacri is a treasure trove of myths and stories. In 1970s, a hole appeared on the east side of the church. Different rangers on the scene actually have described to me that it looks like a spring house and another like an escape tunnel. <clears throat> they stopped the excavation of it after only getting seven feet down, so that's a mystery for another day. And there are no photographs of it uh, that show it. In the 1990s, a docent was giving a tour and doing her best Vanna White, and she sunk in the ground four feet deep. Everybody thought, oh, we got a tunnel, we got something again. But on the north end of north end of the mission, right over here, there's an underground river about 30 feet down, and that had actually eroded away the ground. It must have been pretty scary for her to imagine sinking. Sure, you're going to be in a grave because that's in the cemetery. The church ruins for the Park Service, well, they're a constant battle. An adobe building wants to fall down the minute you put it up right. Okay? You remove the plaster, the modern construction techniques, and your work is never, ever done. The church tells us thousand stories over all its fragile plaster walls. I can show you where Black Jack Pershing spent the night. He was actually there in 1934 and said, I spent two nights in that corner. Uh, on the wall are the names of two brothers. One becomes a famous poet about 1905. You can still buy Don Mark Lemon's poetry on Amazon if you look today. His brother, also on the wall, was a school teacher. He actually murders a man that he's having an affair with the guy's wife. So he went to Yuma Territory Prison. Um, Linda Ronstadt's great 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 grandfather, at 19 years old, wrote his name on the wall there. And um, the Oteros, which are a very famous pioneer family in the valley, got this first Spanish land grant in Arizona. Uh, actually have their names on the wall. Uh, this one out on the corner here right now, we believe may be a Buffalo soldier, so we're trying to research that. So um, we've got all kinds of names still in there. By the way, we also teach high school students about graffiti and vandalism, and not the, right on the church. Most of them I can say probably get I think or hope Maybe these days of Tumacacri luck is limited to government shutdowns and budget cutbacks. Tumacacri is considered an important uh, attraction for Southern Arizona. Even the local tribes embrace the place nowadays. The Atham and the Yaqui have made their peace with the mission and feel a spiritual connection and kinship to the property. More often than you think, we hear visitors use the words like magical and spiritual to describe their visit to the park. And I think the grounds and the, and the ruins truly, truly speak to people. 
Tuma Cockery will stand as a ruin and a business long after all private businesses come and go. That's just a fact. Visitation to the park peaked to 46,308 people in 2017. Before the freeway came through, visitation was about 80,000, just to tell you. Uh, the freeways, of course, always hit people. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, due to government shutdowns, visitation decreased, and during COVID, we were down to 23,726. So you can, it's coming back up now. Visitors have changed too. Uh, since COVID, we found a marked increase in local people from New Mexico and, and Phoenix and Gilbert. Um, People constantly tell us that they've always meant to come and they're finally doing it, so that's good news. And we're getting a lot more families than we used to. It used to be retired people from Wisconsin, but we're seeing a lot more now. And everybody reports a pleasing experience at the park. Now this national park, this Tumacacri mission, has a lot of memories. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad, but I guarantee you they're always interesting. And sometimes I wonder if it's just the memories that keep the wall standing there. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I sort of gathered that when the initial when Kino first came in there, he was rather warmly accepted. What do we know about the native religion that they would so, I don't want to say readily if that's not, but accept a whole new religion to come into the area. What do we know about their belief system that made them so receptive to Kino and what he was bringing? Part of it's the process um, in California, where you hear all kinds of negative things about missions and everything. Uh, Father Sarah jumps off the boat in 1767 and goes, surprise, these people know Kino's coming, they know the Spanish are coming, they know they got new stuff. I like to compare it to like, Remember when we started getting Japanese car manufacturers over here, there wasn't a sushi restaurant in the place. And then once we started doing that, we adopted Japanese food and all that kind of stuff. So it's similar to that. The other thing is the Jesuits are very good about using your belief systems and incorporating it into the Catholicism. I mean, the Catholic Church has always done that well. Um, the Franciscans less so. And Kino was one guy. And so he's, you know, the impact isn't there. A guy who follows Kino named Campos gets totally discredited. After Kino dies, Campos is the only one on the whole frontier. So he's not here often or anything. But this is a, it's a great story. The Spanish, he's, he rather is, he's stubborn. He fights against Spanish authority. And they come to remove him. And this is at San Ignacio in, in just over the border in Mexico. And the Octum line up on the hillsides, just like in the movies. And basically, you want to take them away? We'll give you something. So they protect the priest or the priest and everything. We see a lot more cooperation here than we see conflict. And do they get abused? Yeah. But uh, but it's not quite the way you hear about California. Do they have like a great spirit? Do they have a sun Thank god? You. Do they? That's, that's the other part of this thing. Uh, it's superficially, at least, the Ottoman have one creator. Okay. You may have all heard of Etoy. Etoy is not a creator. Etoy is like sort of a devil figure. He messes with your life, but the creator is the creator. Um, they bury people. They do it mostly vertically, but they bury people. They have a three-day warning period. There are a lot of similarities to Christianity. So it wasn't a huge leap from one to the other. It's not a huge leap. It's at least superficial. And it's I, this is simplistic, but the way I always say is, you want a microwave and a cell phone? Join the mission. If you don't, stay in the bush. And here in California, you've got an army that has nothing to do, nobody to fight. So the priest will say, "Those people ran away. We'll bring them back." But here, they're fighting Apaches, they're fighting Seris, they're fighting everybody, and they don't have time to get involved in this. We see over and over, like after the 1751 revolt, the army says, "We want us to go get those people and bring them back," and the priest goes, "God, no, please!" <laughs> and so Father Keller, who's one of the more interesting priests, actually goes up into the mountain and talks them into coming back. Will you be doing any special event for the hundredth anniversary? 
yet to be seen. We are going to have, we do a Fiesta every year, first weekend of December, which is pretty phenomenal. And uh, it'll probably incorporate it into that because December 13th is the first. Uh, the, it, the, it's also the 100th anniversary of the cemetery, October 1st. And it's interesting, the first person buried in the cemetery is a five-year-old native girl. And the last person buried in the cemetery in 1916 is actually a young female, a one-year-old. So it's interesting, we're, we're bookended by young females on, in the cemetery. So, so but we do have, where all our tours are coming back this year, everything's happening, so it's it's all good. Does it, the Luminaria date window on the calendar is what? <laughs> the Luminaria, shh, never heard it. The Luminaria event is December 24th, Christmas Eve. So that's okay. when they first first come out. No, that's that's the day. They, it's just one Christmas day. Eve, one day. Okay. Too bad does it for a week, I think. But okay. we do we do one day. We don't advertise it. Um, it uh, this last year we did it again finally, and it got advertised in Green Valley News, and we're like, oh my god, we're going to have five thousand people here, right. you know? And we can handle three, and uh, it rained that day, so <laughs> we actually less less than two thousand people came because they didn't understand. It never rains on Rick's parade, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate and it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. 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 And they were just, she said, like a tax ship. Yeah, we did everything. We enjoyed everything. She said, you would have just loved to have been here. And I said, that's really nice. But the next year, my husband and I, our lives sometimes go like that. And, and he put it like a shooting sport. I mean, I don't appreciate him. I don't want to put him in but I don't need to participate in that stuff. Right. And I said, he can't come and sit. Once we do this kind of stuff, the reason he quit is his legs to become more than he is. I'm excuse me, this is the opposite. They were like a range of things. I don't know what she was saying on your chair. So there were a range of things. Yeah, that's yours. Yeah. That's mine. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Because he just yeah, hates that. He just hates it. Yeah, the first 11 people. He doesn't hate it, but he's like a two-year-old. <laughs> he's running around the store coming to the night. Come back and Bringing all kinds of treasures. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. the girl said, no, that's right. right. We don't even try. I, I turn, I turn yeah. around to ask him a question. It's like, yeah. no other. Yeah. yeah. We came up in oh, it's been probably 40 years. Since years. Since we we even even have to walk with a t-shirt. Oh, I don't even think we ever went to a sweater, a jacket. He, he, he walks in, gets right what he wants, turns around and walks out. There's no going room. up and down the aisles Plus to see if there's anything on the sale or anything. It's pure it's mission. <laughs> and then sometimes it is, and it's like that was our first experience. And then, like I said, we come back we come into the house and find out that we can volunteer there. So we can volunteer there. So we can volunteer there. Cool. So I wish they'd replace that box. And what would you say? I can't win it. I've always been a volunteer. For a tell what time it is. You're a Kennedy <laughs> generation also. <laughs> to have that. Yeah. Yes, what? Yeah. You I actually country. Country. it's a world national fight for the volunteer every year. Oh, wow. And the Rangers do paperwork. And George, when you were saying search morning, you stood too far back from the Rangers. You're going to have to rescue me. That was a show. Our first two Rangers. 948. All right, let me see if I can get back to that talk. But that's cool. So, so you've been told the word. Look at that clock. You tell me what that clock is. Cool. And thank you for doing this. Uh, <laughs> it's the gold hands. I guess I need to look at it. It's, black hands it's saying there. about 920 ish. Well, no, he said a piece Yeah. It's nowhere near the night. Well, oh, wait a minute. Both hands are out there. Okay. So yeah. See, there you go. It's got that one long bar at the bottom. So, it, okay. It's, <laughs> I'll pull out my stuff. Shouldn't, it shouldn't be that much work. I'll pull out I'll pull out my stuff. Remember, the Technology, young people. In Arizona. They can what? They can see. Ah, uh, so okay. And there's my watch. That's what the show is. No, it's not my arm. I can't see this. The hands are over there. That's why I can't see this. It's got that one long bar on it. It's got, yeah, it's got those four black ones, but it's the gold ones. And they are approximately the same length, so I can't do it. It's just a It's one length. Oh, you said that's pretty good. It's a conversation. For a reason, I'll get away with if there's enough people here, I can go ahead and start it. Because yeah, in California, it's either like a day of the week. But here, they're just around a little bit. Some of these new tours. The schedule, sir. You can fence off here. Yeah. Well, one of them is on this right hand, and they will shoot. And then the other one is purchased. That's only in Arizona. Are those going to be David? No, it's it's uh, it's every Wednesday, January through March. If you have a group of people and you can tell people together, whatever, you're willing to do the first do this much. We only do it January through March because they probably say we should go down there and just wish it's gonna have the reporter people to do it quick. Yeah, for for news work. But that's for the show. We generally these last two years we have been taking so now we're going back to the show. But it's, it, it, I just think it's the best thing. And what I, when I do it, I do it. I don't do Wednesdays. We do. I tell people. Tell me you're a park ranger. There's always somebody who comes. We do reciprocate. So, so if you're with a different right, volunteer right, group, right, yeah. search. So your, your photo had three dollars. And I will see it tomorrow. Still, oh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, it's ten dollars a person. In fact, we might. 
we we make seventeen thousand dollars a year in fees, and we spend eighty thousand dollars a year in personal fees. So they're we're getting a new superintendent right now. Yeah, not retired. Yeah, and it's probably good. So, um, but Mike Madrano is the new guy. He's out of Texas. He's a naturalist. He believes in interpretation. PhDs. He's really good. Seems like he's. He came from one of the yeah. He was the head of the resources over there. So, anyway. But, uh, 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 so, I don't know what I was saying. So, I don't know. We'll come up. We'll come yeah. We almost came last Christmas Eve. We really wanted to. So, we're visiting friends in Texas. And then with the rain, we had to move it to the next day. Yeah. 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 I want you to know the rain now. It was beautiful. The rain stopped at 5 p.m. as it always did. And, and <laughs> It was so sad because we were just expecting it to be drowned. And it just, and we had 1,700. So we didn't have, we weren't giving out hot chocolate because we, everybody was still going COVID and everything. So, not so. Well, the whole, I don't know if you know, the volunteer situation changed. People aren't doing the weekly stuff anymore. They're doing, they want to come in, they want to do a task and then go. So it's real hard to get them. I've lost. I'm now in charge of dozens. I'm a GS5 guy. And I'm in charge of dozens. I'm doing GS9 work. But, but anyway, I'm in charge like of all the tour dozens. 11 or 12. <laughs> but I, and so I, I'm trying to, I'm, I've got a few people. I'm, I'm training them all because the people have gone, they've been supervised, so they've kind of gone rogue. So i got to bring them back in. But I don't know. It's fun. Anyhow, but yeah. We still have to go out to dinner with every night and go out of the street. Well, that's what happened. Oh, no. I've got a small time. This is. Did you guys have COVID? I got it. We flew back to the West Coast. She doesn't want to see her and then uh, we'll help load. You have a presentation. Load that for you. Yeah. 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 Let me, uh, I wanted to see if mine would first. I'm not going to be here until 10 to 10 minutes. Sure. We're going to change that still. I've been back by. Yeah. We go up to check out the technology and communication. We go up to sort of the bare tree cabins and we stay up there. So. That's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Just ignore the chaos for a while. Oh, yeah, that's my jump around the session. Right, well, let's see what it is. I get it for you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's Program is serious, and we thought this one sounds interesting. And then he noticed your name, and it's like, oh, is that okay, we now? Got somebody <laughs> said you were at two months, and I can't remember if it was Bill, I can't remember if it was Sue. Somebody said, I thought it was Bill. Hey, Sue, is still doing stuff with the gardens in there, right? That's an old project with this. Mission gardens? No. He's, well, he's doing mission gardens, but yeah. he, was, he was trying to do something with Park Service. So. I mean, they, they did the heritage thing, and so we got a guy who is does our museum there now. He's phenomenal. He's a he knows everything insects, snakes, you name it, plants. He's doing it. They they have always had great lines in the and they never produced. And he 
came with the idea to go pull away from the walls of Hidden Bridge for the first time ever. And, uh, and uh, uh, it was funny you were talking about Bob. Bob, Bob ran me off the sword. Yeah. Me, so it was back when Park Service was going through all their safety crap. And really, if you got in an accident, you were thrown out of all sorts of stuff. Anyway, so I was in charge of the search and rescue. Yeah. Basically, for the story. Went to Tim McCocker, who was going to be very interesting, but we got along there. He found a place where he was good at I worked at Soro two years as a seasonal manager. So I worked on the west side and then they had a job on the east side, which was 20 minutes away instead of an hour away. <laughs> Ed Robert was a good guy. Yeah. I'll tell him I should next time you see him. We need to get over to Bill's again. I, I don't yes. see Larry since he's retired. Uh, the last we talked to him. <laughs> and I haven't seen Sandy in so long. Oh, oh, that's it. I was thinking of a guy. Yeah, sure. Sure. Oh, He seems happier, but he did he did do it to himself and I talked to people who were injured. At the time he was still working. They were having a rubber time. When you know it's time to walk or something. And we still visit Suzanne every now and then. It's been a year to her. Forever. That's the key. Everything. I don't think that's not the key. Oh, I can try loading that now. We're way ahead of schedule. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Yeah. She did that. Or she did that. Uh, she you need to make sure you get it done. Uh, she bought, she bought, somebody bought another trailer. So it is